Hi, <laughs> I'm jumping in here to give a little introduction on behalf of the bookstore. Uh, bear with me, some of this is going to be more relevant to the folks who are here in person. Um, so welcome everybody, whether you're joining virtually or live. My name is Liberty and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, we're a 16-year-old cooperatively owned bookstore run by a queer and trans collective here in Southern Appalachia. Um, I'm going to give a little introduction to the physical space, uh, uh, which maybe people got yesterday if they were already here. Uh, I just want to highlight the fact that there's a bathroom in the building, which is um, over here to y'all's right. Um, if you need to find that, there's also a bottle fill station and fountain um, with coolers of water available in the vending area. So definitely try to stay hydrated today. It is hot. Um, also want to call attention to where the exits in the building are. Uh, you probably came through the main door. Um, there's also uh, an emergency, or, uh, just a, an exit right over here, uh, kind of behind you. And then of course the roll up door, just be careful. There is a cable on the ground there. that could be a little bit of a trip hazard. Um, feel free to get up and take a step outside if you need some fresh air or just need a little break. Uh, in the event of an emergency, we're gonna exit through those doors. If for any reason we are not able to exit through those doors to the front of the building, there is an emergency exit in the back of the building, um, which is over here to y'all's left. Uh, that exit uh, we do not normally use and it is not accessible. So in the event, for whatever reason, that we have to leave through that door, I'm just asking everybody to be mindful of uh, the folks around you and any mobility issues that we might have um, so that we can all kind of leave the building in a way that uh, doesn't leave anyone behind. And hopefully that won't be an issue. Um, also on the list of things that hopefully will not be an issue, just wanna call attention to those of y'all who are medics um, or uh, have some medical training that we do have a bleed control station um, on the wall over here to your left in the event that medical supplies are needed. Um, a quick note about parking, since it came up yesterday, uh, the lot behind our building is not ours, and um, there is a risk uh, that you will be towed if you have a car in that lot. Um, and in general, I would say people are just kind of fussy about parking in our neighborhood. So whenever you leave your car somewhere, please look really carefully to make sure there aren't signs telling you not to be there. And know that if you do park there, while I will not come find you and give you a hard time, someone might tow you. <laughs> Okay, uh, the last little housekeeping announcement here is that if you didn't already get on it, there is uh, a book fair uh, announcements uh, thread for Signal, which you can join. The best way to join that is uh, using the QR code uh, at the welcome table. If you haven't yet visited the welcome table, uh, it's been relocated today to the vending area. So definitely check that out, grab a program and get on the announcements list uh, in case there are any changes to the schedule. So today is the second day of the fifth year of uh, the Another Carolina Anarchist Book Fair. And uh, we're incredibly excited to be able to host uh, part of the content again this year at Firestorm. And um, we're also really excited to uh, have Mohamed Bamiye with us here, I think uh, joining us at the greatest distance of any speaker. Um, so much appreciation to you, Mohammed, for uh, being willing to do sort of this extraordinary, because I think this is the first time in five years we've ever had a speaker who wasn't present in person. So we're breaking ground. Um, uh, Mohammed Banier is a sociology professor at the University of Pittsburgh. He previously served as chair of the board of trustees of the Arab Council for Social Sciences, editor of International Sociology Reviews, affiliated uh, fellow of EUME in Berlin and as a senior fellow at the IFK in Vienna. He taught at, among other places, New York University, Georgetown University, and the University of Massachusetts. His publications include Life Worlds of Islam, Pragmatics of a Religion, Social Sciences in the Arab World, Forms of Presence, and Anarchy as Order, the history and future of civic humanity. And of course, we're very excited uh, today to be talking about the no state solution. Um, 
In order to make this work a little better, uh, we also uh, are pleased to welcome um, Shuley Branson to the conversation, who will sort of be standing in on behalf of the audience who are not visible uh, to our virtual audience or, um, or Muhammad. Uh, Shuley is a queer and trans anarchist writer, translator, and community organizer and teacher. Shuley is the author of Practical Anarchism, A Daily Guide, and is currently working on a book about trans anarcho feminism. Uh, they often contribute to the Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist radio show and podcast based here in Asheville. Um, so much appreciation. And for folks who are joining uh, virtually, I'm, I'm sorry that you can't see our full audience. We've got maybe 60 or 70 people here live. So we've got a very full house with folks spilling out uh, onto the deck of the building um, with an outdoor speaker in order to, to hear this conversation. And I know it's going to be uh, an exciting one. So thank you again, um, Mohammed, and thank you, Shuli. I will pass off to you now. All right, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be here to facilitate and I'll just let you take over now and as you need me to jump in, let me know. Yeah, um, uh, thank you, uh, Shuli, um, and, and, and I appreciate the generous introduction. Um, I uh, want today to, uh, from this, uh, I, I wish I were able to be with you uh, in person, um, uh, but we do what we can uh, with the technology that we have at our disposal. Um, I'm happy to be, uh, to be for this invitation to share with you some uh, idea that is still developing, actually. Uh, the idea of a no-state solution uh, kind of emerged um, or has been talked about occasionally over the years, uh, but never really uh, with no analysis really behind it. Uh, and uh, kind of the real kind of thinking about uh, this idea began in a conversation uh, a few months ago uh, and and uh, is still developing also with the help of audiences uh, like this one. Uh, it is, of course, uh, as you know, uh, motivated greatly by the war in Gaza right now. Uh, but it, the idea goes beyond Gaza itself and also beyond Palestine and beyond uh, kind of the particular conflict, which provides the empirical material really for uh, for the idea in general. Uh, so I'd like to go through the idea in four or five steps uh, with you today. First, I'd like to talk about why, uh, first step is to describe why the obvious solutions uh, to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict um, uh, have never worked. Uh, and uh, then I will, uh, second, I'd like to talk about uh, the, <clears throat> the social history of Palestinian kind of self-organization and agency at outside, uh, at, that is how a society kind of have kind of manufactured itself as a society without a state that already, let's speak up. So the experience of living without a state is already with us. Right? It's not something that we uh, need to think of it as necessarily something that requires new experiences. Uh, and then I'd like to spend some time talking about the virtues uh, of the no-state solution itself uh, within the larger scope of Middle Eastern social histories, um, of which Palestine is uh, the part. Uh, and then uh, fourth, I would like to spend some time talking about the failing states as we have them today right? uh, at multiple levels, as well as the revolutions against them that are also a symptom uh, of their failures and, and the rejection of the people of those states. And finally, uh, because it's always kind of mentioned uh, when we talk about uh, any anarchist idea, uh, realism, uh, the concept of realism or what do we mean by it and how to actually approach uh, the whole idea of realism, given the kind of realities uh, that we have. Right? Uh, so there's a lot to unpack uh, in uh, 45 minutes, I think, um, or so. Uh, uh, but uh, but it is doable, I think. Uh, first of all, uh, let's begin with the with the obvious solutions. Right? Uh, that is for the first uh, or for the, for the last five decades or so, uh, there seemed to be uh, uh, at the official level uh, really one kind of realistic, so to speak, uh, solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which was the two-state solution. Right? Uh, and that seemed to be a realistic prospect for a long time. Uh, and continues to be talked about uh, because uh, it was kind of a solution that the international community itself endorsed 
uh, that the um, uh, United Nations uh, was behind, uh, that the United States itself and uh, officially uh, endorses uh, the European Union, uh, Arab governments are behind it. Uh, many Palestinian organizations have already accepted it, including Hamas, by the way. Uh, before 2006, Hamas itself even that uh, has, uh, uh, that's not known very well, but has actually accepted the two-state solution. Uh, and for various points in history, a majority of Israeli and Palestinian societies also kind of accepted the two-state solution. So you have a solution uh, that had all the ingredients of success right, behind it, right? uh, yet we have never been able to get to it. Sir. Uh, and this is, seems to be a puzzle as to why. Uh, there are three reasons why we have never gotten to that, uh, and we will never get to that, actually. Um, uh, first uh, is the balance of power right, uh, as a problem. Uh, that is, we have two entities here. Uh, one is an Israeli state uh, that is armed to the teeth, uh, that is very powerful, uh, that has an unlimited support of the one superpower remaining behind it, right? uh, and that is also relatively wealthy and secure, in spite of the fact that it talks about insecurity all the time, but it is the most secure regime in the entire region. Right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, you have a Palestinian a population that is dispossessed, uh, that is uh, kind of um, uh, lives under occupation or in the diaspora, right? uh, that is weak, right? uh, that uh, is kind of unable uh, to, uh, because of its relative weakness vis-a-vis -vis the Israeli government, is unable to get the absolute minimum uh, that it can get out of this kind of solution. So you have a, you have an equation, right? Uh, and if we think only about Israel-Palestine, where one partner has all the power uh, and the other has none of the power, right, so to speak, right? which means that uh, basically the powerful party in the equation has no incentive to provide the absolute minimum that the weaker party is able to live with, uh, and the weaker party has no resources to get the absolute minimum that it can live with. Right? Uh, so that solution or that kind of formula, right, uh, kind of can be changed only when you have a third factor entering into the equation that kind of fixes that balance. Uh, but actually, we do not have any force that is willing to enter basically into that equation. Uh, the United States is not going to do it, uh, neither will the European Union, neither, neither would the Arab governments, so to speak. Right? And that uh, leads me to uh, the kind of the second reason as to why the solution uh, is not going to happen, uh, namely that the Palestinians themselves are not a priority for any government right, uh, in the world. Right? Uh, that is, uh, even though uh, there are governments that in principle and in theory support uh, Palestinian rights and support uh, kind of Palestinian rights of self-determination, these governments are either far away uh, or unwilling to invest the kind of political capital that will be necessary to solve the problem. So this is a reality that is verified by history. Uh, we had uh, lots of talk about the two-state solution before, um, uh, namely after every crisis, like the crisis we're facing today, that, uh, that we have basically lots of diplomatic talk about the two-state solution that emerges uh, kind of diplomats, uh, secretaries of states, and so on, on travel around the world and say a two-state solution, two-state solution, yes, we have to work on it. And then once the crisis is over, all that diplomatic language is forgotten and we go back to the business as usual before the war. That has happened before, right? Uh, and that will happen again after this war, right? That, that is, there is a talk about the two-state solution as well to pacify the kind of the, the Palestinians for a while. Uh, but then uh, once the war is over, once the crisis is over, we are going to back to business as usual because state interests basically have nothing to do with the Palestinians. Right? Uh, the third reason uh, why the no state solution is not going to work uh, has to do with settler colonialism. Uh, the fact that Israel is a settler colonial entity, right? From the beginning, ultimately, right? Uh, and I could go on for a long time about, uh, about that particular point. But it is a program uh, that is based, like most settler colonial uh, kind of experiments, on dispossessing the indigenous population and treating them as a problem, basically, as opposed to actually a partners uh, in the land. Uh, and you see that from the beginning of the Zionist project, where, uh, for example, if you look at uh, David Ben Gurion, uh, who is uh, seen as the founder of the State of Israel, uh, in 1915 he migrated to Palestine. 
and he worked on the Linux project. He was good with languages. He spoke seven languages. Uh, Arabic was not one of them. So the language of 95% of the population of Palestine, when he went there, right, uh, he did not bother with that, right? Uh, and furthermore, he told his people after 1948, you have to remember that we are in the Middle East only in a geographic sense, but we are, we belong to a different civilization, meaning the West, ultimately, right? Uh, so here we have a settler colonial uh, kind of entity uh, that regards the indigenous population. In fact, all uh, the surrounding uh, kind of uh, populations are in, as inferior to them uh, and as people for whom land will be taken away. That is also true of even of the kibbutz uh, as an institution, uh, uh, which is imagined in the West basically as an embodiment of socialist utopian principle. But what's not known about that, it was in fact, uh, started uh, as a racial experiment. Uh, this is what people don't know about the kibbutz. The first kibbutz in 1908 right, was established as a way to exclude Palestinian farm labor from uh, Jewish farms that were being established uh, uh, in Palestine, so to speak, and, and to, to create a kind of uh, a, a cohesive Jewish-only communities, cohesive Jewish-only businesses, cohesive Jewish-only society, so to speak, in Palestine. And that project continues until today, right? And you see it in the form of settlements that are being kind of built in the West Bank and also previously had been built actually in Gaza. And so, and of course, uh, these settlements uh, uh, are happen at, their, their, their costs are enormous in terms of land, in terms of water resources, uh, in terms of uh, expropriating the properties uh, that belong to the indigenous population. Uh, for example, Gaza uh, from 1967 uh, until 2005 uh, was in fact under Israeli occupation directly. Uh, during that time, uh, Gaza had Israeli settlers in it. Right? Uh, there were 7,000 uh, Jewish settlers in Gaza and 1.5 million Palestinians. Right? Uh, the 7,000 Jew settlers controlled 45% of the land of Gaza and half of the water resources. Right? Uh, so you have 7,000 people right, having as much land and as much water as 1.5 million people. This is settler colonialism, so to speak. Right? And that is the character, basically, of the settler colonial project that continues to be in full force until today. So these reasons, right, these three reasons basically are a kind of why, kind of what looks like an obvious solution, right, uh, that uh, could be uh, put in, 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 in place that is state-oriented, basically will never work. Now, uh, the second kind of uh, line of my discussion is how do Palestinians respond or have historically responded uh, basically to, to the situation? because obviously part of the story is the agency right, of, of the indigenous people, ultimately. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, the Palestinians, uh, basically after 1948, uh, were in fact expected to disappear as a problem all time. And this is something that John Foster Dallas, uh, the Secretary of State under Eisenhower, predicted back in the 50s, he said, uh, the Palestinians, uh, the, the issue of Palestine will really cease after one generation. Uh, when you have a generation of Palestinians uh, kind of uh, uh, are born outside of Palestine and have no connection to the land, and, and then uh, the problem will be resolved that way with time. Right? We don't have to do anything about it. Right? Uh, of course, uh, that did not happen. Right? Uh, and in fact, we had the opposite happening, and then you had several kind of Palestinian generations in the meantime, that in fact have even more commitment to Palestine. And how did that happen? Uh, the, there are three sources right, uh, of, uh, uh, for this kind of uh, uh, remaking of Palestinian society, all of which happened from below and without the state, so to speak. And this is really important to keep in mind that, uh, first of all, the refugee camps themselves right, as a site of generating Palestinian identity. Right? Uh, so the refugee camps uh, where uh, many Palestinian refugees lived and continue to live, in fact, 
uh, for two decades after 1948. Uh, as you know, uh, the refugee camps are not recognized encampments. They're supposed to be temporary structures. Uh, they do not really have a state law governing them. There are no property rights, for example. But once you have generation after generation, basically living in those the kind of informal settlements, obviously some kind of law is going to cover the, govern their life somehow. That law was Palestinian village culture. Right? Uh, so the Palestinian village right, with its culture, right, uh, with its uh, uh, kind of um, uh, codes of mutual help uh, and solidarity and conflict resolution, right, all these kind of known sort of quasi-anarchist voluntary traditions migrated with the Palestinians into the refugee camps. Basically. So the Palestinian village, basically, with these traditions, became one of the ways of actually making Palestinian life kind of possible. Right? And the, the, the old traditions continue to live in the diaspora, especially in the camps in particular. Uh, by the late 60s, there's a new culture uh, that began to kind of develop itself in the refugee camps, and that is the uh, revolutionary culture. And so you have modern uh, kind of organizations, right? uh, uh, all of which became part of the PLO, right? And those were uh, organizations that had the character of political parties. Uh, they had militias, uh, they had bullet bureaus, uh, they had they worked across the refugee camps. Uh, they tended to have a meritocratic culture. So in the sense that people kind of get assigned position on the basis of uh, their capability as opposed to uh, kind of social up, uh, upbringing and so on. And so you had then, these two cultures, the traditional kind of village culture and the modern revolutionary culture, right? Both of them kind of together uh, conspiring to create a modern kind of Palestinian identity, right? In addition to that, you have a third kind of movement happening globally in the global Asian diaspora, which has, which is the establishment of a Palestinian civil society uh, outside of Palestine. Uh, that is from the, the kind of... Uh, uh, the uh, the associations of cities, uh, the kind of uh, the workers unions, uh, women uh, organizations, uh, pharmacists, uh, doctors, uh, etc. All of them organized as syndicates globally, so to speak. And all these syndicates also became part of the PLO as well. Right? So over several decades, uh, Palestinian society that was expected to disappear recreated itself basically uh, in in diaspora without the help of any state. And so that is part of the learning process of how to live without the state, how to create kind of a sense of a strong kind of identity connected to a cause of justice without the help of any state. Uh, and even though kind of most state expected that should the, the Palestinian structure simply disappear basically as a result. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, now uh, the, uh, the uh, this experience of living without the state, uh, and this is one thing I need to emphasize, is not unique to the Palestinians. So, if you look at uh, the uh, the population in the surrounding uh, area that we call the Middle East, you also see similar experiences, right? especially from the '90s onwards, but even earlier, depending on where you look. Right? Uh, that is uh, with the beginning of the neoliberal era. And the neoliberalism begins in different time, depending on where, depending on where you look. Uh, and uh, the and with the neoliberalism, basically, you have a situation where uh, lots of people, essentially in Egypt uh, or Iraq uh, or Syria or Yemen or what have you, basically uh, begin to realize uh, that uh, states that they have tolerated for long uh, are not going to do much for them. You have, therefore, Kind of uh, lots of people living outside the state, building shan shanty towns right, uh, with each other's help, uh, without permits, uh, without legality, uh, without even connection to the electric grid, and so on. Uh, one house at a time, uh, one family at a time, helping each other, and eventually you have millions of people establishing entirely new cities uh, without permits right, uh, and without uh, and without uh, kind of a state license, um, uh, and that. 
has consequences for the revolutions that I'll talk about in 2011, ultimately that, namely you have all kinds of societies that, uh, in the region, uh, in addition to Palestine or parallel to Palestine, that are also learning how to live without the state, even though there is a state above them, but it is useless to them, or at least it is their enemy, to speak that. Uh, now, let me uh, move to from this reality to a little bit of history, right? Uh, that is the uh, the kind of the historical patterns oh. of social organizations of the um, uh, in uh, in the um, uh, in the area that we today call the Middle East. Right? Uh, now, historically, and by historically I mean before the modern state, before the colonial period in particular, right? uh, the uh, the free movement of the population across borders was the norm right, in the entire region. Uh, there were technically borders, uh, but they were not policed. Uh, people did not take them seriously, right? Uh, the free movement was a norm. Uh, that that was historically the case, and because it really kind of made it possible for people to adjust to problems of demogra demographic uh, kind of pressures, uh, and also because long distance commerce uh, was kind of the main source of wealth. Uh, basically, in uh, in the region as a whole, uh, and as a result of that, uh, you have uh, uh, especially the urban uh, areas uh, of the Middle East, uh, like uh, Damascus, uh, Baghdad, uh, Cairo, uh, etc. Uh, all of them develop a multicultural, rich, interconnected life, where you have several communities living by side side by side, and none of them really feeling uh, a pressure to uh, kind of um. Uh, build their own state, uh, nothing dependent really on state for those people. Uh, for example, uh, you had uh, Jewish communities, historically, large ones uh, across the Middle East, in Baghdad in particular, uh, in uh, Northern Africa, throughout Northern Africa, in Morocco, in Nigeria in particular, uh, in Egypt, uh, in Syria, in Yemen, and so on. Not in Palestine, right? There was a small Jewish community in Palestine as well, but most Jews in the Middle East were elsewhere. Right? And, uh, and they never thought about going to Palestine, right? even though uh, that was so-called the promised land, and there was nothing to prevent them actually from going there. Right? But there was actually no need to do that. Right? That was a historical reality, basically. Right? Ethnic identity was not set in stone, right? even though it did exist. People used the idea of multiple loyalties right, mm -hmm. as the norm, and we're using it to a region that is interconnected, and where states, even though they did exist, they did not mean much to the day life of the people, even though there was an empire, we call the Ottoman Empire, that presided over the whole thing, most people did not see that empire in their everyday life. And that empire itself basically survived for 600 years precisely because it left people alone, but it was actually based on multiple loyalties that the right of each community within the empire to rule itself according to its own laws. Um, and so that's the reality, uh, basically, that began to be disfigured with the creation of monasteries, uh, basically throughout uh, the region. Uh, the pattern of social organizations that we have historically, and that continues to be familiar to a lot of people, was the pattern of free movement that was the pattern of kind of a mutual solidarity intercommunal life together side by side no need for state to impose any of these kind of rules uh, on them and that is a reality that europe basically after world war ii only after world war ii began to discover uh, as something that it needed to work through in order to actually prevent the third world war from happening in europe this period. we already had that right except that modern colonialism disrupted kind of that historical uh, kind of reality and that historical experience, but it has not gone out of memory. Uh, when you look at, uh, for example, ideologies like pan-Arabism, for example, it was in fact right, uh, based on uh, not nationalism really in the traditional European sense, but on people rejecting the artificial kind of division of Europe by outsiders, so to speak out. Uh, and kind of reject, rejecting those ideas of new borders. So borders basically were uh, not meaningful right, until the modern period, so to speak, right, as they should be, I think, historically. 
1948, uh, and after the uh, the uh, the Prussian Nakba, uh, in the summer of 1948, um, uh, uh, some Palestinian refugees, peasants in particular, uh, began to try to go back to their fields uh, in time for the harvest, uh, and they were shot and killed at the borders of the new Israeli state. That had never happened before. And at that time, people began to realize that borders now mean something a lot more rigid than they ever meant, than meant before. And that is a new reality that we we'll continue to live with until today. Uh, now, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the reality of the states as we have them today, right? Uh, and this is actually where I want to expand the argument as to why these states actually are failing uh, right now across the board. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, we have um, a clearly dysfunctional region. So the Middle East right, uh, right now has five major wars, uh, more wars than anywhere else in the world, all of them major. In Gaza, of course, right, uh, where it is genocidal, pure and simple, uh, in, but also in Syria, right, uh, uh, also in uh, Yemen. Uh, Sudan, uh, Libya. Uh, you also have a situation where uh, you have financial collapse. Some countries that is imminent, to speak of. Lebanon or, or Egypt, for example. You have all kinds of local hostilities at a uh, at smaller level that can break into civil wars as well. Right? Uh, wars that are owned a lot of them right now, but they're also frequent in the modern history of the region as well. So clearly something is not working in the modern structure of the region. Ultimately, right? uh, in addition uh, to that, you have states uh, that are uh, that uh, that are based on uh, enormous inequality as part of their structure. For example, uh, you have in the same region, very rich countries, right next to very poor countries. Right? So if you look at the region as a whole, the Middle East is the most unequal region in the world right now. Also the most militarized region in the world. The two go hand in hand. Let's speak right. Vast inequalities, vast investment in a security apparatus. Let's speak right. um, and, and problems of security kind of compound because ultimately uh, what happens is that if you treat the population as an enemy, so to speak, right? and then that, and you call them uh, human animals, uh, like the Israeli um, uh, uh, Minister of Defense called the Palestinians, uh, they're going to hate you, uh, and they're going to become your enemy, and you are going to have a security problem, and then you are going to complain about secu your security problem, which you yourself has, had, has generated that. Uh, so you have a problem of security because the, the, the governing institutions that we have themselves create the kind of insecurity against which uh, they complain. Uh, and also that justifies further investment in the security apparatus, uh, more militarization uh, of society, basically, and the use of force as the first resort, so to speak. Uh, so all these are symptoms of failure of the systems as we have them today. Uh, these are, of course, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, problems uh, that result from the fact that all these states that we have in the region have been created uh, essentially as imposed structures. So we don't really have anywhere in the region something like an organic process right, of state creation where actually a state is actually established because of the will of the people, so to speak, or something like that, 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 uh, that comes from the bottom up, or at least is represented by some kind of elite force that translates what it has to be public will. Uh, that never happened. Uh, for the most part, you have states uh, that have imposed itself or been imposed by colonial powers against a willing and unwilling population. Right? And when that population was too unwilling to accept the new state, uh, you have something like uh, in Israel, uh, where you have an ethnic cleansing, where the population is violently expelled, basically. 
uh, elsewhere in the region, that is the same, right? Uh, you don't have as much in the way of ethnic cleansing. Occasionally, you do have that, uh, but for the most part, you have actually large populations that regard the state to be their enemy, ultimately, and it is their enemy. It regards their, their, much of its population as a threat to it as a state. I think that. Uh, now, uh, in uh, uh, so in in uh, so either you have that condition where you have large population being guarded as a threat, or you have an apartheid system like we have in Israel. Like Israel, of course, is imagined often in the West as a democratic state, and it actually does advertise itself as a democracy, uh, and is talked about as a democracy. Uh, but if you look at the entire population that Israel controls between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. Uh, half of that population has democratic rights, only half. But the other half have no rights at all, which is what we call apartheid. So it is not, it is a single state. The entire, all these populations are governed by a single state, right? and it is not a democracy, and it is an apartheid kind of condition. And that, of course, uh, calls itself democracy. South Africa, under apartheid was also a democracy, right? We should not, but democracy only for the whites, ultimately. Uh, so these two uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of conditions, uh, uh, democratic claim as well as the apartheid system, can live side by side, uh, and that is uh, what we have. Uh, now I want to um, uh, just spend some time talking about um, an end uh, sort of. A, 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 uh, um, an earlier um, revolutionary period against the Mara states, and then I will move to the modern revolutionary period. I don't, I'm not going to go too much in details because of the time. Uh, but one thing about states that are imposed on populations uh, is that uh, uh, they, uh, those states, kind of sometimes become right, tolerated by the population that they control to the extent that they can deliver some goods, to the extent that they promise something like some post-colonial states have done in the global south, promise uh, development, modernization, sovereignty, rights, etc. And when a state appears to be doing these things, right, uh, then it might be tolerated even by population that is hostile to it originally. Right? And we did go through that already. Right? So we have in the Middle East, basically beginning with the 50s, early 50s, uh, so-called the free officers uh, era, where uh, a number of young officers from the army took, uh, uh, took control of government in several countries, including Egypt, first Egypt, then Iraq, uh, Syria, Yemen, Libya, and so on. Uh, and those three officers tend to be young men, uh, typically from, not from part of the old elite, but actually uh, often from marginal social background, uh, often from rural background, in fact. And they presented themselves as a man of the people type, right? Uh, and basically had socialist ideas, right? Uh, and they invested in the public sector uh, and tried for a while to can redistribute wealth more equitably. Right? Uh, they invested in uh, women's rights as well. Right? Um, uh, so for a while, uh, it appeared that that kind of revolutionary elite, right, so to speak, right, uh, that of a modern but also marginal background, was would be able to deliver this kind of modern project that uh, that will take us into kind of uh, economic modernity, the progress prosperity, rights, and so on. Right? The problem, of course, with this system is that all of them were dictatorships, ultimately. Right? Uh, there was no accountability. And of course, with the entry into the neoliberal era, all that project was abandoned. Right? And of course, uh, that the hope uh, in what used to be the free officers era kind of collapsed completely. Right? So as a result, in 2011, uh, we have basically a new revolutionary era that we enter. We have the area of so-called Arab Spring, uh, which so far we have two iterations of it, 2011 and 2019. 
uh, all these revolts basically had a character that we never saw before. Right? Uh, that is, all of them happened without guidance by any political party. They did not produce free officers or, or anything like that. Uh, they did not, they had no interest in vanguardist uh, leadership, right? Uh, they seemed to be nonchalant uh, about organization of centralized leadership. Even though earlier revolutions in the region, in fact, did have those properties, they had leadership organization, et cetera, right? um, and, and so on. Uh, so, and it is something that I studied quite a bit uh, because I was interested in why we have what I call this organic anarchism basically as really part of the mentality of those revolts. Right? And it seemed to me that there is a history behind that, right? that the history that I just described, ultimately that uh, that we have tried vanguardism, we have tried the free officers, we have tried kind of these dictatorships right? uh, that we, on the hope that they will perhaps uh, enlighten despotism would work uh, in our benefit. All of that we have already tried, so to speak. Right? Uh, and we ended up against the same wall right? every time, so to speak. Right? Uh, and all these systems became corrupt repeatedly, not only corrupt, but also now genocidal and murderous. Right? Um, so out of that reality, uh, organic anarchism evolves. And you will see it in action by millions of people who never read any books about anarchy, right? who do not even know what anarchism means as a concept, right? And who will not even call themselves anarchists if you ask them. Uh, but it is an anarchy that comes out of the earth, out of an experience where you have a hostile authority facing you that is doing nothing for you and you have to rely on each other to survive. So this is the anarchism that comes out of the necessity for survival, the necessity for mutual assistance, the necessity of a mutual help, but the necessity of figuring out a way to resolve conflicts kind of uh, peacefully with your neighbor, so to speak. Right? And that is what the Palestinians have been doing all along without a state. So, to speak, right? so in a way, uh, basically, that is where we ended up uh, in 2011. Uh, kind of, uh, and that is uh, where uh, kind of also uh, the, the idea of uh, kind of historical memory, right, so to speak, uh, that kind of emerges in the form of summary judgment on the record of earlier historical uh, or historical revolutions, uh, and what we are supposed to be in uh, in the uh, in the in the current climate. So it seemed to me uh, that the 2011 uh, the Arab Spring movements uh, suggest not simply people wanting to overthrow a regime, which was the main slogan, but rather people wanted to overthrow the state, ultimately. That was not, of course, the conscious uh, slogan. Right? That was not the expressed slogan. Uh, but if you look at what people were doing, uh, the fact that they did not actually uh, care about forming a single political party to represent all of them, as had been before, um, uh, then, uh, and, and if you look at the psychology of the revolution itself, where millions of people for the first time felt more free than ever, because in the middle of the revolution, uh, the greatest experience is that precisely at that moment, you are not being governed, uh, to speak out. And that becomes a precious memory, basically for everyone who had participated in it. Uh, so we have a kind of a reality where, uh, not just in Palestine, uh, but also across the region, we are actually for, you know, rejecting kind of uh, the principle of being governed, to speak out. Precisely because not out of an ideological Kind of consciousness of by of by of anarchism, uh, but out of the historical experience that brought brought them collectively uh, in that direction. Now, when we talk about the no state solution in Israel Palestine, basically, um, we have of course uh, to evaluate it on the basis of the solutions that have that appear to be realistic or have historically appeared to be realistic, such as the two state solution or which is not going to work for the reasons that I just mentioned at the beginning, or the one-state solution. Um, uh, if these actually happen, uh, fine, I guess, uh, for a while, uh, but they are not really any more realistic than the no-state solution at this point. Um, uh, 
The, uh, the problem, of course, uh, that we face right now is that uh, we have a reality that is completely unacceptable. Right? Uh, and it is a reality that is created by realism as a perspective, right? by people wanting to actually think within the bounds of realism, uh, what we call realism, right? namely a uh, kind of a statescraft, basically a diplomatic kind of effort, um, a kind of uh, UN resolutions, uh, Etc. Like state-centered kind of thinking, that is that tends to be called a realistic kind of thinking. Uh, but if you look at the Palestinian kind of history, the Palestinian resistance movement, so to speak, uh, you see that actually uh, that movement was never realistic. That is, you have a very powerful enemy, right? Uh, so the realistic thing to do is to surrender. That is the realistic thing to do, right? But we haven't done it, that's to speak. And we fought against a powerful enemy and against all odds, and knowing full well what you are fighting against, right? And the same thing had happened in other revolutions as well, so to speak, right? Uh, when Khomeini in Iran, I'm not praising Khomeini, uh, but I'm looking at the particular kind of way of avoiding kind of realism as a way of motivating. Uh, kind of the revolution. Again, he had no prospect of success. Uh, he didn't know that he was going to do. Uh, and he was saying all kinds of things that were completely unrealistic in the middle of the Iran revolution. Right? He did not understand basically how the Americans uh, were going to uh, view him. Uh, he would say, he would say to him, what do you think the Americans would do in the middle of the revolution? And he would say, well, we are on the right path, and because of that, the Americans will support us. Of course, his advisor would say, that is not how politics work, and of course, but that was not important for him, right? Important for him is a conviction that we are on the right path. I am doing the right thing, so to speak, right? Against all odds, and it is my historical responsibility to do it. Right? The same thing you see among the Bolsheviks, whatever you think of them, of course, completely unrealistic, but they succeeded to this period. Right? Uh, or Fidel Castro. Right? Most revolutions, in fact, were carried into success by people who are not realistic. Right? People who actually not only rejected the reality right, uh, that they lived in, but also rejected the realism as a way of thinking about reality. To speak. And, and highlighted things like energy, vitality, yeah. basically a kind of conviction that one was on the right path that one's cause was just. That was the most important kind of spiritual uh, kind of force behind any revolution that ever succeeded. Uh, the other reason to actually get away from realism uh, as a way of analy uh, analyzing the situation is because uh, of uh, uh, what we know about social science. And I am a social scientist, uh, so I know, I think I know what my colleagues do uh, and also what I do. Uh, and what we do is that we try to analyze reality. Uh, we try to actually understand why the reality we have is what it is and not something else. That means you analyze reality to, and at the end, of what we call understanding reality is the way by which you figure out that reality that we have right now is, is here because of structures that are necessary. So it is here because of some necessity that my analysis has shown to be there. And because it comes out that the product of necessary forces, it has to be what it is and it can't be else. So sometimes even the social science kind of analysis uh, that is suspicious of reality ends up actually by understanding things, actually confirming this necessity. Uh, so revolutionaries don't work that way. Uh, they tend to actually think of a way uh, beyond reality, especially when the reality becomes so objectionable, right? as we see in Gaza today, right? so intolerable, right? yeah. uh, and and so and, and and to be the product of people who in fact uh, have the power to actually think that they are the ones who create the reality in the world that all of us have to uh, live with. So the no-state solution basically comes out of these clusters of factor, a kind of. Uh, a way of, uh, out of kind of a necessity to think beyond kind of the limits of reality as, as we, we as we have it, uh, but also with historical awareness, 
of how things had happened in the past, and also with awareness of how that reality was opposed by people from the law using various means, uh, violent as well as nonviolent, right? But in order to actually, but uh, moved only by conviction that the cause was just in spite of the fact that they were weak uh, and much of the reality of the world conspired against them. So I'll stop here. Hopefully, if I missed anything, um, <laughs> we can talk about it uh, in, in in the coming, um, I think, half an hour or uh, I don't know how much time we still have for the many time. Yeah, thank you so much. That was um, that was a really amazing uh, talk. So if you're if you're open to questions, we sure. I will have I'll facilitate the questions in the room, and then also people who are online. If you um, put in the Q and A section, I will be able to read your question um, to the room and to Mohammed. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'll open it up if anyone wants to start the conversation. And then I'll repeat what people say so you can hear Mohammed. I can also start. <laughs> um, I'm giving it a second. Is anyone raising their hand here? Okay, so I, uh, yeah, I, I thought that was like a really helpful uh kind of outline of the situation and um and these prospects and like you know when i when i've talked with other people about the idea of a no state solution the one of the things they say is that that's unrealistic but then um as you say like it, the other sort of outcomes are un intolerable right because it it also um just involves so much death and destruction and then you also talk about like that the actual organization of, of the social organization of Palestinians in diaspora under even under uh, the apartheid regime has this kind of organic, uh, horizontal, anarchistic sort of uh, way of living. And I, I feel like I, I guess I'm interested because you're also bringing in this like sociological lens, like, like the way that we talk about these things versus the way that they're actually lived seems to like miss some aspect of the, the that lived experience on the ground and um and so i guess just to open up the first question like what do you think the sort of distinction is between the way that we talk about this issue over you know in the west how it's represented to us versus the way that people on the ground are living it because I, I i feel like a lot of that is not even though we have sort of some kind of media representation even uh, made by the people who are there in Gaza, there's something that isn't being communicated over here and that we can't see. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that distinction. It's, um, well, it's, it's a problem for global communication, ultimately. So what we have is uh, uh, people, uh, there's a lot of things that we, know, that we don't know about Gaza right now, right? Uh, precisely, and that's intentionally so because of the killing of journalists, about 95 journalists or more at this point have been killed right, in Gaza. Uh, intentionally, right, uh, they were they were clearly marked as journalists and they were intentionally killed. Right? So right. there was actually an effort to actually reduce the visibility right, of what is happening in Gaza, also reduce Gazan voice, basically, in uh, kind of uh, in our conversations. Uh, that did not prevent, of course, a solidarity movement from emerging uh, anyway. Uh, but it is true uh, that uh, what we have here is uh, kind of the no state kind of reality it is a lot more present in Gaza right now. That in the sense that people, all of them are refugees. Right? You know, right? uh, two point three million people, uh, uh, and they have to somehow rely on each other to survive uh, more than ever before. Uh, that had already been the case. Uh, by the way, before uh, for this war, ultimately, but even more so uh, right now. So one thing uh, we uh, that is really important is to try to kind of convey those experiences, like kind of uh, to each other uh, in a way that we understand. Uh, now there is something global that is happening, uh, uh, not just about Gaza, but in fact. Uh, the uh, the global protest movements everywhere really since 2011 I think 
did have anarchist features uh, like what you saw in Arab Spring. And so that's a global kind of way of thinking, think about protest uh, that is kind of traveling around the world uh, right now, uh, especially among young people who actually don't pay as much attention to the Russian media, but do kind of collect information from all kinds of various sources right? and kind of build connections to causes on the basis of more horizontal kind of networks of transmission, transmission information uh, than used to be uh, the case before. Uh, and so the, um, uh, the, uh, the thing that keeps us going, I think, uh, in the middle of these crises uh, uh, is original thinking uh, about solutions. Uh, and that is, uh, you see a human tragedy right, happening in front of you that is produced by the powers that rule us. Uh, so what is happening in Gaza is possible uh, because the American government is making it possible. Okay. The weapons are American weapons that are being used. Uh, the money is American money, so to speak. Uh, to speak uh, um, uh, the U.S. is complicit uh, in the genocide uh, that is happening. So is Germany, by the way. Uh, so is kind of uh, other European countries. So it's uh, so the uh, so understanding the complex complicity basically kind of is, and I think part of the solidarity comes out of the awareness that there's kind of complicity at least by governments in the kind of during that crisis, uh, and also the fact that governments that produce genocide of that kind, including the U.S. government, are automatically illegitimate, right? And precisely because of the injustice that uh, that they are. Uh, that they are doing. So I think part of the trick is to really uh, change the discourse. Uh, so for example, uh, in Europe, in the US, people talk about uh, the right of Israel to, exi to exist. And that's taken for granted as a meaningful question. Uh, uh, but uh, states <laughs> don't have a right to exist. Right? Uh, they 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 force themselves into existence, right? uh, and they exist because they have the capacity to force themselves into existence, right? and that's true of any state. Ultimately, it has nothing to do with right. But if we are talking about states having right to exist, then the real question would be: Does Palestine have right to exist? In fact, in that equation, Palestine is the one entity that could use a right to exist. Um, the same thing about right to self-defense, at least in the U.S. and Europe as well. Uh, when Israel is attacked, sorry, well, Israel has a right to defend itself. Uh, do the Palestinians have a right to defend themselves? That also becomes because they are the ones who live under occupation. They are the ones who are a lot more vulnerable, uh, basically, to injustice of occupation than, uh, than Israel. So part of what I think uh, the practices, the communicative practices, uh, that uh, that I think we need to cultivate more of is how to kind of create a new language, kind of out of the out of the fact that the kinds of barrage of questions and dogmas uh, that come our way really divert our attention from what should be what we should be talking about. I don't I don't know if this is actually an answer to your question, but just as a quick follow up, um, because on this idea of the right to exist like it's it's very hard for people to think outside the idea of like a national or like ethnic determination for the the reason of existence for a state um mm -hmm. and so like the two-state solution obviously comes from this idea that like everyone has their own state based on their own ethnicity which is obviously uh, not real um do you do you think that there's a possibility of like kind of through discourse changing the idea that that because it's so ingrained in 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 our heads that like people Every people deserves a state. Yeah, uh, that's well. That's uh, I mean, in principle, it's not wrong uh, to talk about right to self determination. Uh, right. the, of course, the problem with uh, the right to self determination, as it was formulated, is that it is res restricted to nations. So you have to be a nation. To have right to, uh, the, the Wilsonian, uh, the Wilsonian version of it. You have to have to define yourself as a nation uh, to get self determination. But you can be anything else that is not a nation. Right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, we can either expand 
the idea of the right to self-determination to various groups that are not do not uh, regard themselves as nations, and not necessarily think of it in terms of in terms of the state. Right? Uh, now, if a two-state solution happens, and this is a thing actually, the if, if a two-state solution happens uh, in a way that is just, that would be preferable to the occupation. Actually. So, uh, if you have a one-state solution where everyone is equal, that would be even preferable to the two-state solution. And if we have no state solution, then that's preferable to the one-state solution, right? for all kinds of reasons that I mentioned. So it's not as though um, uh, when we say no state solution, that is the only solution uh, that we can practically live with. Uh, but rather, I think we talk about uh, order of preferences. Right? So there are each solution along the way solves some problems, but it may create others. So to speak. And so it's not uh, so it's not an, uh, an idea that is meant to be exclusive of other possibilities. Ultimately, um, yeah. of course, of, of, of a lot of people are committed to nationalism yeah. and nation state. You are not going to be able to impose a no state on them. This um, kind, but the no state kind of concept of political life does not get a life until it is presented at the table and become part of the arguments, uh, the cluster of arguments that we talk about. So that's the idea, it to expand kind of the parameters uh, of the thinkable, right? especially given that everything that we have to talk about up until now has not worked. Um, I saw you do you want to ask and then I'll repeat it for Mohammed. Thank you. I just uh, curious about your like uh, how you would describe the Palestinian authority within the no state solution, in particular people who like members, the current members of the Palestinian authority who came from the PLO who describe the current um, work of liberation as state <laughs> Were you able to hear that question? It showed up I on my- I, Yeah, I think I heard most of it, which is, um, about uh, the what I think of the Palestinian Authority, ultimately, uh, and its connection to the PLO. That's that's what I heard. Um, so, I, I'll answer. And how and yeah and how and the and how it fits into your analysis. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, the PLO uh, is uh, kind of uh, the national the cluster of uh, the, the combined process of, of the Palestinian National Resistance Movement altogether. Uh, and all of it basically emerged from the law. Uh, and uh, and it is not a state until, of course, the Palestinian Authority comes in. Uh, the Palestinian Authority uh, was meant, of course, as a transitional uh, period uh, until we have final status negotiations that presumably would result in a Palestinian state. That never happened. What happened is that the Palestinian Authority essentially became reduced to a police force for the occupation. Right? So the only thing uh, that it does uh, is simply make the occupation cheaper uh, for the Israeli team. Uh, and also, it is not really a practical authority, ultimately. Uh, the Israeli army can walk in at any time into the territory that is normally under the control of the Persian authority and arrest anybody it wants, so to speak, right? or simply shoot people. Right? Uh, so it is, um, so the Persian authority basically from an Israeli perspective uh, is kind of regarded as something like a uh, support mechanism for the occupation. This period uh, is not actually expected to develop into anything more than that. Uh, and at best, it will become something like Bantustan, basically, in the South African apartheid model. That, uh, that is the most uh, it can aspire to be. Uh, of course, uh, what happened in the meantime is that uh, the uh, the Palestinian Authority itself uh, became uh, essentially uh, adjusted the troll, and it does not really do anything more, even though nominally it is connect, committed to the Palestinian independence, but it does not have really the power to uh, to to pursue that, and it's actually not doing anything other than perpetuating itself as an authority. Right? Uh, its funding uh, entirely the, the depends on the outside world. Right? Uh, it comes uh, out either out of, out of donor countries right? uh, uh, that so it is dependent on the goodwill of those countries, 
or from uh, whatever uh, taxes that are collected by Israel at by from residents of the West Bank. So the, the people who live under the Palestinian Authority pay taxes to Israel, not to the Palestinian Authority. Israel collects that money and in theory is supposed to send it back to the Palestinian Authority. That money gets withheld all the time. And right now it is withheld. That's the guy. Uh, as a punishment for whenever the Palestinian Authority tries to do something for Palestine, like for example, a kind of uh, join the genocide uh, um, uh, kind of uh, case against Israel at, uh, in front of the International Courts of Justice, or uh, by actually uh, asking for membership of Palestine in the UN, which just happened. Also, the the tax money was withheld from the Palestinian Authority as a punishment for it. Uh, so it is not a real authority, ultimately, right? and most Palestinians are not against it, right? and they want it to be dissolved. Right? Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and there is a demand uh, right now for a new Palestinian election, where Palestinians actually do have, or should at least, as part of the right to self-determination, determine who should be represented. Right? So that's where we are now. There is also talk about reactivating the PLO, which is still there, but is on the sidelines because of the existence of the Palestinian Authority. So. I'll take one question from the online. Um, um, I'm going to ask this one. Uh, so it says, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering about the connections and perhaps fruitful friction points between practices of Islamic life worlds and practices of stateless local organization and self-governance. How are these parts of your work connected, complementary, contradictory, etc.? Yeah, so, okay, that's um, uh, uh, that's a good question. It would take uh, a long time to actually answer. I wrote actually a lot about Islam, that, uh, uh, as uh, not as a religion but as a social system at, uh, over time, uh, and I was interested in uh, finding out uh, why do we still have Muslims today. That, uh, so I'm not a, re a religious person, uh, but I'm interested in religious per people uh, and why religions actually continue to exist and inspire people after uh, the time space uh, of their creation, actually over centuries. Uh, and for me, a uh, kind of the explanation was uh, that uh, religion survived to the extent that uh, they provide people not with doctrines, right? uh, not with orthodoxies, uh, but in everyday social life with some kind of a pragmatic compass uh, to everyday life. Uh, that uh, that uh, So in a way, uh, religion uh, becomes a way by which people talk to each other across class system right? uh, and across the tribal divides, across linguistic divides. Right? So, uh, as a, so we have a way by which religions have to create the global systems, global citizenships, ultimately, across languages and ethnicities and so on. Uh, but in a way that allows kind of the global community to kind of uh, to, to communicate and also across class interests. So the rich and the poor and the farmers and the etc. can actually talk in the name of the same religion, so to speak, and express their interest in a religious language. So that's kind of uh, my approach to kind of an, an, an religions as kind of capable of surviving to the extent that they provide that practical, pragmatic concept uh, kind of approach to uh, to everyday life. Uh, I'm less interested in religious um, authorities, ultimately, right? Even though sometimes I do look at them, but I look at kind of the, uh, the, the ordinary pragmatics. So in terms of the area we're talking about the Middle East, um, uh, we have uh, a religious revival as of the late 70s. Uh, and that was uh, relatively new and surprising uh, because in the post-colonial period, uh, most uh, political systems and most and cultural life also was dominated by a secular elite. And religion not seem to be on its way out as a historical force uh, everywhere. So the and all of a sudden by the seventies you have religion coming back to life as uh, not as a religion but also as a political force, and which was a new thing ultimately uh, with the Iranian revolution. 
uh, and gradually people who used to be secular leftists, many of them became Islamists. Right? The founder, for example, of Islamic Jihad in Palestine in the late 70s, he was a secular pan-Arab nationalist with no connection to religion. You saw the Iranian example, and so, well, this could work for us. Right? So it is the same cause. Uh, sovereignty, independence, uh, modernization, etc., anti colonialism. Uh, we tried to do it through leftism. That took us only so far, but now the same cause, the exact same cause, can be carried through under the banner of religion. So the so the what interests me is how kind of these kind of oppositional energies migrate from one ideology to the next. Right? Of course, Islamism is not eternal as a political force uh, because 2011, 2019, with the Arab uprising, uh, there was actually very little religion in the revolution itself. Right? Even though religious political parties benefited from the revolutions, but they did not lead it, did not initiate them. They were thoroughly secular revolutions. So by 2011, the oppositional forces also moved away from religion into a new, into more like anarchism, so to speak, right? unself-conscious anarchism, right? uh, and continues to be somewhat there, so to speak, right? in, in an unorganized form. So uh, for me, relig religion, uh, basically, as a political force in particular, uh, as a guide to life in a world that the, the person, the little person does not control, right? basically. As part of a continuum of experiments and resistance, right? Uh, and in the same mind, and exist in the same mind, like other ideology. You can be, for example, uh, um, a, a Muslim believer and an anarchist, and also believe in some, in uh, say, at the same time, in the possibility of um, um, uh, enlightened despotism, for example, right? The mind, right, is of the person, of the ordinary person, uh, basically does not consist, I think, of one clear ideology that kind of replaces all others, but in a dialectic, there's a dialectic process that is going on, and choices are made on the basis of experience as which path you want to, you want to go. And that is how I understand religiosity, basically, as part of a larger mix of strategies of resistance, basically, in the same mind, in the same society. Question from in the room. Yeah. Uh, do you think that the ways that Road Java has done its sort of autonomous uh, ruling system could be a model for the no state solution? Uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah, yeah. I got, uh, I got. Um, uh, Road Java is an experiment, but um, uh, and uh, and it's ongoing experiment, and I think it has to be looked at that way. So it is not really a finished system. Uh, it is uh, it is also and there is uh, not to be forgotten. Uh, it is one of the products of the Arab Spring from 2011. The same movements that we're talking about that produce all these revolutions across so many countries also produce Rojava. Right? So it is really a part of the larger picture of revolution. It just happened to work this year on Rojava, right? where actually people did take over power, right? uh, for a while at least. Um, I think it, uh, a lot have been learned from it. I just met um, some academics who actually tried to build the four universities in Rojava that I just got, became aware of. All of them are new. Um, yeah, and they're doing uh, a lot of uh, really interesting work. Uh, the, the thing about Rojava is that it is also does not live in a vacuum. So around Georgia, you have the Turkish army, you have Russians, you have the American forces, you have ISIS every now and then moves in. You have the Syrian army as well. Uh, so you have lots of forces like in the area, so to speak. Right? And I think it would work uh, basically if, uh, if uh, solidly, if it kind of commits or shows commitment to the principles out of which it was uh, kind of emerged, which is inter-ethnic, to speak right, uh, not 
not Kurdish only, or I'm not Arab, but, but rather kind of uh, allows multiplicity, basically, of uh, practices uh, and types of rule, and types of conflict management uh, within it. So it is, it is there, and I think we can learn a lot from it, and it is really part, of this, I think, with as part of the larger kind of a cluster of experiments in self-rule that emerged in 2011 throughout the region. And it is the one that we pay attention to because it is the one that seemed to be more successful so far. But it is part of a larger movement across the whole region. Question in the room. I I got one here on this online. Um, how do you see the future of nourishment within anarchistic mutual support for life within community while the colonial powers maim, ransack, poison, and steal the land, given the continual killing of resources when this fundamental colonial practice? Um, and then there's an added thing. Uh, I'm thinking of the reality of land made not only unsustainable for life, but depleted entirely of nutrients for decades, particularly given the practice of foraging and self-sustained practice within anarchist and survival communities. So yeah, I guess the question about the land and the realities yeah. of that. This is um, uh, this is a difficult language, uh, a difficult um, uh, issue uh, uh, to kind of address. Uh, and Gaza is an extreme case, uh, in the case in the sense that actually in the war, uh, the entire agriculture of Gaza was destroyed intentionally. Uh, water purification systems were destroyed intentionally as well. Uh, uh, hospitals, all of them were attacked. So to speak. Uh, uh, all universities in Gaza were destroyed, level to the ground. There were 12 universities in Gaza, all of them gone. Uh, Two thirds of the schools destroyed completely. Uh, so it is the practice of war there is to actually make Gaza uninhabitable. Uh, and I think this is really the clear kind of goal of the war. Uh, to make sure that Gaza becomes uninhabitable uh, as a preclude to occupying it without its population. Uh, so uh, we never had a situation like that before, uh, especially uh, in full sight of the world uh, in real time. Um, now, when analogous processes uh, happened, uh, historically, they tended to actually make people cohere more together because they needed each other for survival. Uh, the extended family, for example, uh, became a lot, which is there, but became a lot more important uh, than before. Uh, if you look at um, Libyan uh, society under uh, fascist Italian occupation, remember uh, Italy was in Libya between after 1911, uh, became a, an Italian colony at a time when Italy uh, became fascist or ruled by fascism. And there was a resistance movement in Italy, in Libya against Italian fascism, uh, which resulted in huge massacres of the local population. About one third of the population of Libya was killed uh, during uh, kind of the fight against the Italian fascism. Concentration camps were built for the first time in Libya, before they were built in Europe. That is again something a bit don't know. Uh, so a huge amount of suffering right, resulted from a kind of that uh, conflict uh, against Italian fascism. And one result of that war was the increasing of the power of tribalism in Libyan society. Uh, why? Because the tribe, uh, which was always there uh, as an institution that you need in time of help, but not as an institution that needs regularly, right? It became a lot more important for people's lives. Right? And so the tribe was actually a quasi-anarchist system, right, in a way. Uh, it did not call itself that, but it did not, it did not have prisons, it did not have a police, it did not have executive council, right? It was simply a mutual help institution basically, that was available to help people who belonged to it, who didn't necessarily know each other personally, that you can travel across great distances and knock at someone's door and they count upon them to help you ultimately. 
Uh, that, in times of hardship, becomes a lot more important as an institution of uh, mutual help. So for a long time, I've been actually interested in these so-called traditional institutions right, as really part of the larger history of anarchism. Right? Uh, but we don't really think of them that way as part of the larger history of anarchism. Right? Uh, but they are, in the sense that they are mutual help or mechanisms that do not rely on police or force, uh, that are voluntary uh, in nature, that do not govern your everyday life, but they can provide help when help is needed in life. And in times of conflicts, uh, like we have in Gaza, uh, and, and other gas processes historically, you find these traditions, traditional institutions become stronger. Sometimes that results in society itself becomes more, more becoming more conservative also. That, that's part of the deal, really, uh, that comes with it. Uh, so people adjust because they have to, right? Uh, in times of, uh, of, uh, of hardship, and they and they revive or give more credence to the institutions that are familiar to them and already there. Sometimes, as in the case of the Palestinians, over time they create new institutions, uh, like uh, what you see in the emergence of a revolutionary culture, basically in the Palestinian refugee camps, eventually. Question. How do you see the transition or transformation happening from a people without a state because of Zionist colonization and occupation to a people without a state after the liberatory practice? So just to repeat, um, how do you see the transition from uh, being a people without a state because of Zionist uh, oppression to a people without a state from with a liberatory uh, from a liberatory perspective? Oh, that's, uh, I don't know how that's going to happen. Actually, that's, that's I don't have a framework for that because I see actually these kinds of solutions, uh, especially the ones that take an anarchist uh, kind of position, to be uh, a, 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 to be pragmatic projects. So one knows more of, about the nature at, of this entity uh, that we call a new state by doing it at uh, one step at a time. Uh, so uh, one possible pathway is to actually pass through the state. So have a state basically that is committed to abolishing itself in favor of uh, kind of uh, a more self-managed type of social structure. Uh, but in order for that to happen, you have to have, first of all, an awareness that this is what we want, right? uh, that people have to be actually convinced of it. And that is really a part of the allure of anarchism for me in particular, is that persuasion is essential for the process. Uh, the anarchism, uh, I think, is the only ideology uh, that cannot be imposed on those who do not believe in it. That, that's not true of other ideologies. It's not true of Marxism, for example. You can't impose it if you don't want it. It's not true of fascism which can be imposed on those who don't want. And not true of liberalism either, which actually can be imposed on people who don't want to be liberal. Uh, anarchism is the only one, actually, that actually, it, 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 there is a self-contradiction in the notion that you can force it right, uh, on people who don't want it. So I think uh, the, uh, the for me, uh, kind of the appeal of the idea of no state solution comes simply from the fact uh, that um, state-based solutions have been catastrophic right? and very clearly so uh, not just today but over a long period of time right? uh, and so uh, there is a reason to talk about the most solution that comes out of empirically experienced reality so to speak right? and that reality is visible to millions of people right? not just to intellectuals right? and have been visible for to these millions of people for a long time already. Right? It just requires the consciousness. Right? It just requires the kind of uh, the uh, the mental tools to imagine kind of a structure that involves getting rid of the states as we know them. Right? So, so when we talk about a kind of the reality of how to put something like this together, we are talking essentially about communicative process, about persuasion, about planting the ideal on earth. And once it is planted, hopefully, kind of, it's uh, it it becomes kind of appealing uh, on the basis of uh, the superiority to 
in comparison to what we have experienced or we know, which is horrible and genocidal and intolerable. That is where that's where we are. How we put in practice that depends on how many people are persuaded and how they want to put it into practice. It is not something that, um, that but but we can use the existing institutions. Uh, basically, uh, if we want to, and if they're capable of being used that way in order to push through the uh, most solution. I just, uh, as an addendum to that, so like, you know, you talked about the precious memory of people having the experience of kind of organizing themselves. And, but then we also have this like imbalance of force, right, of the police and the, the violence that they're willing to use to impose their structures. So like, I, I wonder how you think we deal with the confrontation of that force, even if we had like a, the mass of people wanting anarchism, if they have overwhelming force, then uh, how do we confront that? Well, you're by resisting it um, uh, in any way, uh, as Malcolm X says, by any means necessary. Right? Uh, so uh, people right, uh, have uh, a right to resist occupation. Uh, they have a right to resist oppression. Right? Uh, and by any means necessary, although Malcolm X actually meant it uh, rhetorically, I think, but also uh, not entirely so, uh, because the idea is that it is the people who live with the oppression who have the right to decide the means right, of their resistance. Sometimes you use violence. Right? Uh, uh, not necessarily because it's practical, right? uh, but because uh, they want to show the energy right, of the struggle. They want to verify to themselves that they're capable of doing something. They want to experience their agency. So not all acts of resistance are rational, so to speak, right? In the sense that they are not intended to produce an exact kind of result or, or program result. Sometimes you fight uh, fully knowing that you're going to fail, right? Uh, yeah. But in the process, and that is something you see in the first place in Intifada, where you have young kids throwing uh, a rock at a tank, right? Like knowing full well that the rock is not going to destroy the tank, right? or in the occupation. Right? Uh, but by doing that, you verify to yourself, basically, that you are still a capable human, that you have agency, that you are resisting, right? and you're showing that you are resisting. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it is, so when I, when I think about resistance, I don't think necessarily about the, pr the practical things. Right? I don't think about effectiveness necessarily. Right? Uh, of course, uh, I have nothing against effectiveness or being effective. <laughs> That's not the point. Uh, but often it is the case that before we, we do anything that is effective, we have to verify to ourselves right? that we are capable agents to begin with. And we do that by acting. And acting itself generates what we call hope. Right? That is, it is possible to imagine a different world because I am acting at this point as basically a capable human. Here. And we have a lot more of those agents the one who have a lot more successful movement. And I think that is how, for me, that at least how distance, resistance had to be thought about, right? Uh, by any means necessary, but not necessarily in a way uh, that is uh, crazy, uh, but in a way that is actually oriented to discovery of self-worth right? and, and of capacity in the world. Well, and that's a beautiful way maybe to wrap up the discussions we're about time um yeah thank you so much for sharing you. your analysis and ideas and taking the time to stream into our book fair um but yeah thank you and if, i guess thank if you, you. want to give mohammed a, a round of applause yeah, thank you all. thanks so we'll be in touch hopefully in the future and Yes, I would love to. Yes, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Good luck. See you.